Why does access to oral health care matter at either the individual or societal level? Over the past five decades, major improvements in oral health have been seen nationally for most Americans. Despite improvements in oral health status, profound disparities remain in some groups as classified by gender, income, age, and race ethnicity. For some diseases and conditions, the magnitude of the difference in oral health status among groups is striking. We've all heard it said, they're just teeth. Everyone I know has had cavities. I can get along without a few or all of my teeth, just like, insert relative or friend name here. But did you know that tooth decay is the single most common chronic childhood disease and that it is five times more common than asthma and seven times more common than hay fever. Despite improvements in the oral health of children compared to previous generations, more than 50% of five to nine-year-olds have had at least one cavity or filling. Just as in data on visiting the dentist, specific populations are more vulnerable. Poor children get twice as much tooth decay as their more affluent peers and their disease is more likely to go untreated. Oral health issues don't just stop in childhood and don't involve only teeth. Gum and surrounding tissues can be impacted and can have devastating results for the individual. The percentage of adults with severe periodontal disease increases at older age groups with approximately 23% of 65 to 74 year olds affected. And just like tooth decay in children, a higher proportion of low-income adults are affected compared to their higher income peers. And lastly, incident rates for oral and pharyngeal cancer differ by race, ethnicity, and gender, putting some groups at higher risk. For example, mouth and throat cancers are the fourth most frequently diagnosed cancer among black males. And at every stage of diagnosis, their survival rate is lower than for whites. Untreated decay due to lack of access can impact society as well through lost productivity, lost school and work hours, and higher unnecessary costs for emergent care. The cost of dental visits in the emergency department is high. For example, in Florida, dental visits to the ED totaled nearly $88 million in 2010. We've seen an increase in the number of ED visits related to dental conditions in recent years. Furthermore, tooth decay and abscesses made up approximately three quarters of those visits. So what are the challenges in our oral health care system regarding access to care? Not everyone understands the importance of oral care. The distribution of the dental workforce does not allow for ample coverage across all communities. Sources of financing for oral health care for vulnerable and underserved populations are often limited and tenuous, such as the case of Medicaid coverage for low-income adults. And lastly, the disconnect between oral and systemic health, which I will discuss in the next topic area. Because of the complexity of access to care challenges, improving access will most likely require solutions with a variety of providers across many settings. So what has been done to improve access? Oral health is often relegated to the back burner of priorities, often because of lack of coverage, but also because cavities are the expected norm in our society. However, organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the American Academy of Public Health Dentistry, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives purport that children do not have to suffer with tooth decay. It should not be a normal part of growing up. And they have supported preventive strategies and campaigns to get everyone on the same page about the importance of oral health. The Children's Oral Health Campaign encourages parents to take action to reduce their children's risk of tooth decay by making sure their kids are brushing their teeth for two minutes, two times a day. The coalition's primary mission is to teach parents and caregivers, as well as the children themselves, to take control of their own health through oral disease prevention. The public service advertisement features activities for kids, such as watching funny online videos or goofy singing groups and playing video games, 
in an effort to communicate the importance of taking the time to brush teeth twice a day for two minutes. You previously heard Dr. Karen Donnellan's lecture on workforce. The field of workforce has always been in constant disagreement over scope of practice at the state level, such as between optometrists versus ophthalmologists, RNs versus LPNs, etc. The conflict that erupts between organized dentistry and the creation of new healthcare practitioner models in oral health is not unique. It resembles the political conflict seen in other professions. However, the impact of the conflict creates a stalemate in moving ahead with effective models, which is where we have been until somewhat recently. There have been several workforce solutions for increasing access at state and local levels, but I will highlight two programs that were created as long-term visions to solving access for rural communities in Alaska and in the Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, Whammy region. The Dental Health Aid Therapist, or DHAT model in Alaska, is not a new model, only new to the U.S. It has been in use in countries such as New Zealand and Australia since the early 20th century. The DHAT program has en was envisioned to reduce disparities in access and disease status among Alaska Native residents by incorporating this new oral health care provider into the 200 remote villages where need is the greatest. And their dental needs are great. Alaska Native children have two and a half times the rate of tooth decay compared to children in the lower 48 states. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, along with the tribal health organizations, recognized that they needed a local solution to their community's access issue. In 2003, the DHAP program began by sending students under their community health aid program to New Zealand for their two-year oral health training, followed by a clinical preceptorship under direct supervision of a dentist for three months or 400 hours. And in only four short years, a collaborative effort between the Alaska Native Tribal Health Center and the University of Washington, the Dentex program was begun to educate future DHATs within the state of Alaska to provide preventive services, fillings, and uncomplicated extractions while under the general supervision of dentists. Despite the initial controversy regarding DHAT scope of practice, the, D the Dentex program has graduated 25 federally certified DHATs who are providing care to one of our most vulnerable populations. Another approach was to addressing the workforce issue solution was developed by the University of Washington School of Dentistry in collaboration with the University of Washington School of Medicine Whammy Program, Eastern Washington University, and Washington State University. The Regional Initiatives in Dental Education, or RIDE program, funded by the state legislature in 2007, was developed to address oral health workforce needs in rural and underserved communities. The curriculum provides a significant amount of training in rural and underserved areas to increase the likelihood that students will practice in these communities after graduation. They have a four-week community-based rotation in a dental clinic in a rural and underserved community in their first year and return to those regional dental clinics for four to six months in their final fourth year. In the first graduating class in 2012, Four of the seven RIDE students already, already were practicing in eastern Washington, a rural part of the state.